I've got the privilege of being here with Dr. Rex Rigby from Australia and he's the National Superintendent for the Wesleyan Churches in Australia, so that's awesome. So first of all, I'm going to ask you just to share about how you came to the Lord and then we can move from there. Well, I guess um, coming to the Lord for me came out of growing up in a family that was devastated by alcohol. Um, as many indigenous people um, uh, went through in Australia. And so life was very difficult for me at the age as, as a young child. When I was about three years of age, I was taken away from home and placed in a Catholic home for handicapped children. Uh, for many years I thought I had polio, but I basically had uh, malnutrition. And at the age of 13, I was uh, taken along to a Aboriginal Inland Missions uh, meeting. And I remember the preacher preaching about um, hell. And I said to myself, if there's a place that's worse than earth, then I don't want to go there. And so I gave my life to Christ. I guess the good news is I found in time that it was more than just being saved from hell, but actually that God loved me and had a plan uh, for my life and was able to enter into that plan over many years. How did you know from there that God was got a wonderful calling for your life? And how did this calling grow and develop? I guess for me, uh, being taken away from home at a very young age, it left me with a scar on the inside that I felt that I was being rejected because you don't understand uh, all the factors at that young age. And so I had this need to belong. I had this need to be uh, accepted. And as I, when I became a Christian, I started to learn that, that God accepted me, that he loved me, and that he had this uh, plan for me that in time unraveled. And as I just sought him, as I learnt more about him as I committed myself to uh, follow Jesus wherever he um, was calling me. Um, that plan continued to unravel and unravel to, I guess, where I am today. I don't know too much about the Wesleyan Church in, in Australia, so can you give me a little bit of a, you know, how many, what kind of size and a little bit of brief, maybe history of what God's done in Australia? Well, the Wesleyan Methodist uh, Church in Australia, it started back in 1948, before I was born, about probably 10 years before I was born. But it started out of um, a guy who was an army chaplain that heard about the um, Wesleyan Church in, in America. And um, yes, with its history as, um, you know, the Methodist Church uh, in Australia, but um, this deep commitment to the Word of God and to the, to the belief that uh, we could live the life that God has uh, called us to be. And so the Wesleyan Church today now has a uh, hundred churches uh, spread over uh, Australia. Uh, we are, you know, a smaller uh, denomination compared to uh, many, um, but it's, it's, it's growing and um, there's a real depth of enthusiasm among the people as we come together and um, our theme is uh, to really see uh, transformed lives across the country. And we celebrate that. We celebrate the transformation of lives. And we celebrate when disciples make disciples and churches reproduce themselves. What was your journey in becoming the superintendent of this 100 churches? How did that happen? Well, if I was going to talk to her about uh, becoming a district superintendent or nas and a national superintendent, I have to really go back to the call. I remember going to a district meeting when I was in my 20s. I was a chef by trade before entering the ministry. And I was not happy with some of the processes and some of the things and some of the leadership at the time. And I was crying out to God while traveling home and saying, God, you have to change this. And a deep prayer, a deep and earnest prayer. And as I prayed that, God spoke to me, not in an auditable voice, but he spoke into my heart and he said, I want you to do something. I'm asking God to do something. He's saying, I want you to do something. 
And that was this journey, but it was really a call into leadership and into the pastoral ministry. And God opened up the door. And if I can, um, I guess, use some of the time just to say that he had to confirm in a couple of ways. The pastor of the local church asked me to come on, uh, on board as a student pastor. And um, the church had to vote for it. And I said, God, the church got to vote for it. But I need a scripture too. I want a scripture that would confirm this. And the scripture that came to me was 1 John 3.16. This is how we know what love is, that Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. And I've held on to that verse, that he has called me and that he um, wants me to, in a sense, lay down my life because Christ has laid down his life um, for us. And the one other little side story, I remember maybe a little bit doubting and I'm crying out to God. I was still working as a chef. There was going to be a couple of weeks before going in the ministry and I'm praying to God, am I really called for this? Am I really called? And I went and sat on the train um, to go into town where I was working and I'm praying, God, am I really called? And lo and behold, the guy on, across the seat from me had left the book. He'd gone and the name of the book was Called of God, Called of God. Now, I didn't take that book. I didn't have to read that book. The cover um, said everything to me. It was just one more confirmation that God had called me to this, and particularly that God had called me to leadership. And as I served him in the pastorate for, for, for decades and served as a district superintendent for 23 years, and I'm um, coming up to... 12 years serving as a, a national uh, superintendent, I feel that I've been able to fulfill with God's help the call that he placed upon my life. I'd like to ask you, how, how are things going in Australia with regard to preaching the gospel among the Aborigines? And even just maybe for some people listening, they don't even know anything about the Aborigines, so you can... Uh, explain a little bit of that to us? Well, that's quite a, a big question. And I guess firstly to explain a little bit about, about Australian Aborigines, um, the indigenous people of Australia, um, which I am a part of. It's made up of uh, what we call many nations, many groups, and they have slight variations in the languages. And my people on my grandmother's side is the Bingabal people. And my grandfather's side is the Camilleroy people. And um, when colonialism happened uh, in Australia, um, what happened was that uh, they stopped us from speaking the law, uh, language I should say, in many places. They stopped the law, they stopped some of the traditional um, customs and that. They took leaders away and took them thousands of kilometres away. They uh, mistreated us and uh, hurt, hurt our people and basically told us, and even sadly some of the uh, missionaries at times told us that our um, beliefs and even our traditional dance corroborees uh, were, were all evil. And um, so we were destroyed people. And that's probably one of the reasons why many indigenous people felt totally empty. And when you're empty, you look for something to fill it. And sadly, many went to uh, substance abuse. They went to uh, alcoholism. Um, and so we're dealing with a broken people, uh, my people, sadly. And um, there's this long journey of trying to turn those things around. And I guess. Um, to hear the good stories, you know, to hear some of the indigenous people that can make a difference. And uh, I guess, you know, my life is a little bit of testimony to that, that, you know, I can be, you know, I became the head of a denomination and uh, that encourages many of our people. I've talked to our young people across the country in different areas and tried to inspire them and to say, um, don't listen to the voices that tell you you can't do it. You can. And um, you can change. You can um, be all that uh, God wants you to be. And so I guess that's part of my message and part of uh, my passion. Have there been some significant Aborigine evangelists or pastors that might stand out to you that you might have some things or testimonies or stories that come to mind? Um, when I got um, became a Christian, um, I was in, a, in that church, I said, Aboriginal Inland Missions, which has got a name change now. 
But um, there were some key people in that that certainly uh, reached out to me, uh, some pastors uh, in that group, and uh, they, you know, really had a joy and, um, you know, spoke into my life. And uh, they, you know, I guess they inspired me to believe that uh, I, I could do it. I could take this, uh, this next step. Uh, they didn't really have much of a youth work because I was in the city and um, in Brisbane. They sent me along to another church which was basically, you know, mostly a white church. With, um, I think only with a you know, small handful of Aboriginals there uh, because they thought that it would be more sensitive to Aboriginal people. Probably wasn't that quite that sensitive. But um, I still had that connection back to, to um, Aboriginal Christians. Uh, and I guess, it was, sadly, on one side, there wasn't a lot that, that you know, I guess that I could uh, look up to that had paved the way uh, before me. I do know of some that have uh, paved the way, um, but not a lot. And so that's why it's important. It's important for whether it be myself or whether it be others, that maybe we can be an example and get some of our young people to say, yeah, I can do it too. Um, I can be all that God wants me to be. What would your advice to be for us for praying for the Aborigines and or really calling people to refocus again for God to move among the Aborigines? Well, what I should say first is that with Aboriginal people, it, there is a deep uh, spirituality uh, it's very much at the core of, of who we are, and I guess like many indigenous cultures, and um, with some uh, many Western cultures, uh, it's kind of pushed aside the spiritual uh, aspect of, of things. But for an indigenous person, uh, this spirituality is still very strong to us and uh, still very important uh, to us. And so many have, uh, you know, come to the gospel. And um, I guess, you know, pray as the many battle with uh, this substance abuse and um, many battle with trying to find a place in society uh, because they're disadvantaged, you know, uh, work-wise and in other ways. So I, I, I guess, you know, there's a number of prayers, but I, I would pray that there would be these Indigenous leaders that would raise up and be examples you know, across the country, and that um, Indigenous people, Australian Indigenous people, would begin to um, look for opportunities to actually bring about their uh, own change and uh, to to strengthen the faith and to to encourage uh, this this growth, both both the social needs in our country and the spiritual needs. I think if we want to see that change amongst Aboriginals, amongst Indigenous Australians, then what needs to happen is Aboriginal people need to rise up and take the place of uh, leading this change with God's help. Well, thank you so much for being an Aborigine Australian Christian leader and thank you for coming to New Zealand. And God bless you even more as a leader for thank the glory of God. Thank you. Great to talk to you. Blessings. And so from that time, I mean, travelling around New Zealand just changed my whole outlook uh, when you consider the background that I come from and the struggles I came from. And then when the New Zealand church uh, became part of the Wesleyan church, um, it, was, it was somewhat exciting. And, and to be able to journey over here um, through uh, many years and to see what God's been doing uh, in your lives um, really warms my heart. And I also have to say the acceptance um, that you've given to me and, and your love that has been uh, reached out to me. And I should say that my wife was hiding down there in the back. And, and just stand up for a second, Lynn. And, uh, Now, um, you'll have to protect me later, so thank you for doing that. <laughs> but um, both of us have this incredible fondness for uh, New Zealand, the land, um, the waterways, and the people. And uh, so, uh, on behalf of myself and my wife and my family, on behalf of the Australian Western Methodist Church, I uh, bring uh, our greetings to you, and may the Lord continue to bless you and what happens here inspires and encourages us, so thank you. 
Well, I've already interviewed Leanne Rigby's husband, and he was the first Indigenous superintendent of the Wesleyan Methodist Church, and his wife is the first Vietnamese pastor's wife, and she's got an amazing story of things that have happened in her life, so it's going to be wonderful to hear you share with us. I'm Lin, and I come from Vietnam. I'm a refugee. I, I was a boat people, I should say, and um, I uh, come from Vietnam. It's a, a war country, and um, it's divided in two parts. The north is communist, and the south is capitalist, and I came from the south. Um, well, when uh, the communists took over, my father was a colonel in the army, so they took him and put him in jail for 13 years. Um, he was the breadwinner of the family, so when they took him, I had to escape to um, save my family. Um, I came to um, um, Thailand, and um, from there, um, I migrate to Australia, and um, um, I didn't know anyone in Australia in those days. And um, but I uh, become a nurse, and uh, I met a nurse from the Wesleyan Methodist Church, and she um, um, introduced um, to Rex, and um, that's how I. Um, become a pastor's wife. Um, I was a Catholic um, in Vietnam, so uh, I never imagined that one day I will marry a pastor. That, that's, uh, that's beyond my um, imagination. But here I am, I just uh, a pastor's wife. So I had to learn a lot and um, uh, a lot of challenges in uh, my days in the ministry. Um, so that's why I just um, want to share with you um, about how I happened to be in Australia and how I become a pastor's wife. Uh, first, very first Vietnamese pastor's wife in the Wesleyan Methodist denomination. What advice would you have for pastor's wives? Well, when I married Rex, there's a lady who come up to me and said, um, it's a big decision to marry the pastor. And I said, why? She said, well, you married to the church, not just to the pastor. And I'm so naive, I don't know what she talks about. But now I know. Um, There's a lot of challenges for me. And, um, but by the grace of God, I get through until today. And I um, enjoy to minister to different people. I see myself as a missionary more than a um, pastor's wife. And, um, uh, just, um, just all the the things that I do, um, I don't think it's much, because my husband said that just be a a wife. <laughs> That's all I need to be, um, and um, just love people as Jesus does. That that's what I think um, a pastor's wife should do. I heard that your escape from Vietnam was very traumatic and yes, yeah, you share about that, maybe there is some important lesson f for somebody. Well, um, I already told you why I had to escape uh, and um, because I need to help my family to survive, so um, I got no choice. I don't know much about communism before they took over, and um, 
But when the communists came, uh, we lost everything, not just our dad, but we lost our houses, our, um, just our living hood. So um, we really struggle. And um, so my mother said that you, sh you have to escape, you've got no choice. And um, I don't know what will happen to me before I make that decision because I heard a lot of stories that you, you meet pirates and you, you could die, you could um, be drowned. And, um, but that doesn't scare me because I know my purpose and I take that risk. Um, but when I um, get on the boat, I just realize that really it's very, dangerous trip um, because uh, it's very unorganized trip. The captain, he's seasick. <laughs> as soon as we get uh, on the open sea and uh, he got no uh, compass, so we don't know where we're going. Um, and I have to hide under the boat uh, in the bottom of the boat. And um, uh, I hear people arguing a lot up, up uh, above me. And I find out later that because he, he got no compass. And, um, but uh, they say that they make, make up their mind that they're still going because if they go back, we can get caught anyway. So we got no choice, we have to keep going. But um, when we uh, reached the sea, uh, the engine just stopped and uh, we got no tools to fix the boat. There are two mechanics on board, uh, but there's no tools to fix it. So it's just drifting, <laughs> drifting nowhere. We don't know where we're going and it's not a sailing boat either. So we just um, just go with the wind. And, um, uh, but when we get to the Thai Gulf, there's a lot of fishing ships, and they call them pirate ships because they know that refugees board got valuables. Uh, usually rich people escape first. And um, so the first ones um, stop us and uh, uh, get uh, everything valuable of us. And they say that if we got any arms, they will shoot us. So we have to uh, uh, we have to confess that if we had got any arms, we have to tell them and give up our arms. Um, so. Um, after all the, um, well, we could say looting, <laughs> and um, uh, they're about to leave and we begged them to tow us because we got no engine and uh, we don't know where we're going. So they said, yeah, we, we, we tow you. But after a short while, they just cut the rope. So we're just drifting again. And we come across another boat, and the same thing happened, but this time we don't have any more valuables to give them. So they took a young, young girl, about eight or nine years old. They just kidnapped her. So her mother just collapsed. And um, just <laughs> drama after drama, and we just, um, uh, just pray that they return. But actually, our answer is, uh, our prayer is answered. They, they did return later on and return um, the girl. Um, and then after a while, there's a big storm coming. And we come across another boat too, before the storm. Uh, and uh, um, they do the same thing, just come over and 
Um, but this time we asked them because the storm coming and we know that we can't survive with the storm. So they told us, uh, not they tow our boat, but they let us on their ship. And um, we, um, we're so thankful that they, they do that. And, um, and when the storm um, just calmed down, they let us back on our boat. And it's already filled with water and got holes in the bottom. So we, we know that we're sinking. Um, we begged them to tow us, but no, they said you have to uh, be back on your own boat. And then we just tried to empty the water out. And, um, but all that time, I see death coming. But because I believe in God, that uh, I pray to God that uh, you know why I have to escape to save my family, so don't let me die. Uh, I plead with him, and, and I just have peace that um, somehow I just know that I won't die. I just believe that, uh, strongly believe that. And, um, but even I see that death is surrounding me. Um, and uh, one day we just saw a chain of islands in the distance. And I just so excited. And I said, well, I'd rather die on the island than in the sea, eaten by shark. Um, and, and everyone's so excited to see land after seven days. And um, uh, so we just, um, we, we just had to go with the wind. We don't know if we'll reach it or not. And one of the person on the boat swim to it because he doesn't know for certain if we reach it. But at the end, we, we got hold by um, some rocks underneath and, and it stopped the boat. So from there we can just swim to the shore. And it's an uninhabited island, unfortunately. So, um, um, some guys on the boat just um, walk up the, the hills and try to look for someone, if they could find someone to uh, ask for help. And they find two coast guards. So um, that's how they uh, contact the Navy, Thai Navy, uh, to come over and rescue us. And it takes two days. And while we're waiting for the Navy to come, we're not sure if they take us to Thailand or they return our boat uh, to Vietnam. So we have to burn the boat uh, to make sure that they can't use our boat anymore. And um, so, yeah, eventually, two days, um, they came and we got rescued to the refugee, refugee camp. And that's where I wait for six months to, uh, to come to Australia. And I come, I never planned to come to Australia because I don't know anyone, not even a friend. So um, I'm very scared. I cry for two days when I get to Australia. And um, I- Could you I, speak English already? Um, yes, I, I was in a French school so I uh, learn a bit of English, and from French to English is not too hard, yeah. So the basic English, I know, but I still have to learn a lot uh, when I get to Australia because of all the slangs and the accent is different. From the English I learn from the book, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a, a big step. But God is with me all the way. Yeah. So I thank God that um, He saved my life. How many brothers, sisters, and then what happened with your mother? Oh, my, I have two older brothers and two younger sisters, and we all scattered all around the world. 
because um, I got a brother in Germany. Um, he studied overseas, and that's what my mum wanted me to join him when I escaped, but never worked as planned. <laughs> and um, my uh, um, sisters, one in France, one in um, America. Actually, my parents later on can migrate to America because of my father, he is free from the prison. And the American got a, uh, got like a, a grant uh, for the, uh, all the officers who been free from the prison, they can migrate to um, America. That's how, yeah, mom and dad and one sister in uh, America. Are they following the Lord? The Catholics do, yeah. They, they really against my marriage in some way, yeah. But um, I'm too far away to stop me anyway. <laughs> yeah. One great thing about this conference is that we get to meet lots of Australians, awesome. So first of all, I ask how you came to the Lord mm -hmm. and then tell us a little bit how God's called you into ministry as well and what you're doing. But first of all, the great way that Jesus has saved you. Well, Matthew, that's a great question. I did grow up in a, in a church. My parents took me to church, but I was conscious as a teenager when I was 13, really understood for the first time that it needed to be a decision I made, not just following in my parents' footsteps, to ask Jesus for his forgiveness. And through the, the preaching and teaching and through Sunday school, recognised that I needed to get my life right with Christ and ask him to be my Lord. And so I did that personally and told others about that and began to grow as a disciple of Jesus. As I grew up, I had a real longing to want to serve the Lord in different ways. So I became a Sunday school teacher and then worked with the youth in the youth group, <clears throat> but heard some missionaries come and visit the local church. and. As I heard their stories of what God was doing overseas, recognised that there was a part of me longing to serve the Lord. And so I eventually went to a Bible college, not really knowing what I was wanting, what the Lord was wanting me to do. And so as I chat to people about wanting to learn more, I encourage them to check out, to go, well, look, there's nothing wrong with going to enrolling in a Bible college to learn more about how to understand and how to tell others about all that God has done for them, even if you're not sure where that's gonna lead you because God will guide you as you go along. And so for me, <clears throat> I didn't end up on the mission field at a Bible college, I ended up pastoring a church. So I met my wife in Bible college and together we pastored several different churches. At the moment, I'm working at Kingsley College and I've been there since 2003, which was the college I originally studied in. And so felt that uh, sense that God had given me gifts for teaching and that had been affirmed for, by others. And so working in the college has been a mix of wanting to serve the Lord and use the gifts he's given, but also to equip others who can then serve the Lord well in their communities. So for some people that is overseas, for others that's in Australia and across the Pacific in the Solomon Islands and in Bougainville. <clears throat> but more recently, I've had a connection again with Bougainville. I was going back and forwards teaching in the Bougainville Bible School in the early thousands and now being uh, appointed as education advisor working with Bougainville. And so again, though, I haven't been to live overseas, but I've been wanting to fulfill the Lord's tug on my heart to equip others for ministry, whether that's in my country or in their country, or to go to another country to serve the Lord. So I want to encourage those who watch the video to 
follow the Lord each step of the way, even if you're unsure where that's going to take you, because God is great at guiding and directing you as you go. So seek to chat to others and help them or ask them how they think God has gifted you, because as you read the Bible and discern how God might have gifted you with the passions and things that you love to do, others see that too. And then that's been my experience, that as you recognise the gifts God's given, that then you say, well, Lord, take these and use them. Even if they don't feel like very much to say, well, Lord, I'll give you what I have because God can then bring that, expand what we give him. Like he did with the miracle of loaves and the fishes, he started with very little and was able to expand it into feeding thousands of people. He can take the small gifts, the gifts we give him, the, even the hurts and the challenges we face, we give them to him and he can expand those and use them mightily. And so I've given myself to the Lord to say, well, Lord, take me and use me. And I encourage you to do the same. Going to Bible college is about equipping people for ministry and I suppose your job is looking for those who, who want that equipping and how can they contact you and or how can they learn more about the Bible college? What, what's your role? You're the principal? Or? I'm the principal of yep. Kingsley College which is uh, the Wesleyan Methodist Bible College in Australia. So unfortunately, we're not able to have students come on a visa, student visa to study in Australia, but we can connect students over the internet. So we have students around the world who connect with us via Teams, via their computer, and connect with live classes with a live trainer and a class that are classmates made up of people around Australia and the Pacific. So you're right, Matthew, that I want to see people who are growing in their knowledge and confidence and ability to serve the Lord practically. So the training that we offer is very practically based. It's equipping people for ministry. Sure, we want them to learn, but it's about not so much what you know, but what you can do, putting your ministry knowledge and skills into practice. So that's the focus of Kingsley College, and that's also then lend lent over to the ministry in Bougainville, wanting to train up people there, lay people, local preachers, and pastors for ministry in Bougainville. Maybe just tell us a little bit more about Bougainville, because I've heard that that's both the sort of New Zealand Wesley Methodist has had quite a bit to play, exactly. as well as Australia. So mm -hmm. how's that happened with the, the two nations and working with another nation, so the three nations? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Australia had an early connection and influence with Bougainville and then over time Australia focused more upon the Solomon Islands and New Zealand picked up more of the ministry and support of the work in Bougainville. So our desire with the connection with Bougainville is not to create a dependency where <coughs> the the church with the more westernized church with more money, for example, um, does all of the, the raising of funds, for example, but we want to equip leaders in Bougainville who can not only preach the gospel well, but also develop a church there that is self-sustaining and a college that is self-sustaining in Bougainville. So the long-term goal is to raise up lecturers and teachers in the Bible school so that they can be training their own people. So we're really wanting to do ourselves out of a job in that connection with Bougainville and with the Solomon Islands. So the connection has been, I guess, restored more recently between New Zealand and Australia working together to support the development of the church in Bougainville. So going forward, we've got some there's a, already a godly man and principal in Bougainville and a dean of studies, but they need the support financially from the New Zealand church for the just daily runnings of the college. They also need support for lecturers. And so part of my responsibilities is to find 
suitable lecturers in New Zealand and Australia or, or other parts of the world who could go and take classes in the Bible school. So through that, <clears throat> year by year and semester by semester, we're seeing ministry candidates trained up, men and women in Bougainville, who can then go into their local churches and make a difference in their communities of leading people to Christ, discipling them, see the church grow, but also work in the community and involved in community development across Bougainville. So that's our goal, but in the longer term, to actually have the leaders who can take responsibility for their own country. So there you go, opportunities for ministry. So if you want to study the Bible more, what is yeah. it through the website? How do they first of all contact you? Yeah, well for Kingsley College, students who are wanting to study with us, the website is www.kingsley.edu.au So kingsley.edu.au It's the best place to go. There's the email address there where you can contact those of us at the college staff directly and we can chat to you about what opportunities there are to study for, this would be for an Australian accredited award. I guess just to reinforce, we aren't able to welcome students directly into Australia on a student visa, but we can have students study from overseas with our live classes and connected over the internet. Thank you, and God bless your work for the Lord. Thank you, Matthew. And I really love and feel that I am part of a wider church rather than a small church in Bogotá. And I'm very thankful and have this honor to be with you this morning, to be part of the conference. It's such a privilege and, and, a, and an opportunity for me to be part of this fellowship. It's good to see uh, people like this, an audience like this, because it's my first time to come and uh, be part of a conference like this and to share to a different audience. Like, it's my first time to, to share uh, outside, of my, outside of my country. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. You are so loving. And your God who cares. And your presence is always with us. As we come before you today, Lord, we Thank you again for such a wonderful time that we can get it here to honor you, to continue to listen to you and see how you can lead us to continue to build your kingdom in our lives and in every way we serve you. So Father, we pray and commit to you this time and your word this morning that we pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to be among us and speak to us. Who you were. And this is our prayer we offer and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I still believe today the power of the Holy Spirit can still work among us, work among the Western Methodist Church in our region to continue to witness this gospel, to reach many into the kingdom of God. It is a blessing for us that we have such a gift that God has provided for us, that God has available for us, that we can depend upon, we can continue to trust, to lead us in our ministry, in our leadership, in our churches, so that we can see the power of God at work in our lives and in our churches.